Okay, thank you for that nice introduction, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, and thank you all for attending. So I'm going to talk to you today about some of the work I've done in the last year with the Partners Innovation Grant uh, in computational pathology. Um, so one of the major problems in pathology in general is that there are a number of diagnostic entities for which there's poor inter-observer uh, reproducibility uh, in diagnosis. Uh, and actually, in every subspecialty of pathology, there's, generally speaking, a common question for which there's unacceptable variability in diagnoses rendered by uh, pathologists, often with kappa values as low as 0.4 or 0.5. Um, so some of us in pathology are, are hoping that computational pathology can provide tools to help rein in some of this inter-observer uh, variability. Uh, one type of tool that you might imagine that could be useful in this regard would be a tool that could localize a lesion, because often lesions are only focally present in a slide, and then provide a preliminary classification as a sort of pre-screening tool so that then when the pathologist receives a case, they'll receive it with a, a region uh, highlighted for them that they should focus their attention on. Um, so this is a type of tool that we uh, set out to develop, uh, and we chose as our model system the endometrium. Um, the endometrium uh, has a, diag a diagnosis, uh, endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia, which is one of these diagnoses where there's relatively poor inter-observer uh, agreement. Um, it's true that some subspecialists can have kappa values as high as 0.8, but they're relatively lower in uh, general practice. So one of the difficulties of the endometrium in particular is that the background glands from which we're trying to distinguish this lesion are constantly changing throughout the menstrual cycle. So um, on the left here, I'm showing proliferative endometrium, so that would be a biopsy taken earlier during the menstrual cycle. Uh, in the center uh, uh, panel, there is secretory endometrium. There are actually a variety of appearances of secretory endometrium as well. There's just one shown here. And then on the right is this EIN lesion, which we're trying to distinguish. Um, and this is an important diagnosis because EIN is basically a pre-cancer. It's a pre-malignant neoplasia in the endometrium. So the diagnosis of this entity uh, has uh, major implications for patients. Um, so we set out to develop an algorithm to do exactly this, to localize and classify EIN lesions. Um, to do this, we pulled cases from the Brigham Archive um, span that, ha that contained background endometrium spanning that whole range of normal that I outlined. Uh, we stained these cases with keratin stains, and we used those keratin stains to direct an automated segmentation uh, of the tissue into epithelial and stromal compartments. Um, so here's a gland. This would be one epithelial compartment. We further subsegmented out nuclei, which are shown here as these light blue shapes. And from each nucleus, we determine the nuclear coordinates, uh, shown here with these red dots. Uh, and then we, that's actually the only piece of information we ended up extracting, is nuclear coordinates uh, for nuclei in each gland in each training and validation set case. Uh, we use these nuclear coordinates to generate graphs. Um, so here's a Voronoi diagram, which is one of the types of graphs that we used. And the concept is that graphs allow us to quantify glandular complexity. So a, a gland that has a more complex shape or that has a complex distribution of nuclei within the gland will have a more complex corresponding graph. Um, but with graphs, there are parameters that we can extract and use to compare um, across glands glandular complexity. So we generated graphs for each gland in the training set and in the validation set. Um, our validation set cases were chosen to contain a mixture of neoplastic glands comprising an EIN lesion and background normal glands because our goal was to try to distinguish those uh, EIN lesions. Uh, one of the issues, which I mentioned earlier, is that we're not so great at identifying individual glands as being neoplastic or non-neoplastic. So for our validation set, we performed an additional stain uh, for PAX2. Uh, PAX2 is a uh, transcription factor that's expressed in normal endometrial glands and that's lost in neoplastic glands. Um, we then mapped the results of the stain back to our keratin stain to automatically label uh, individual glands as being neoplastic, comprising part of an EIN lesion, or background normal. So here the EIN lesion is shown in bright green and the background normal glands are in uh, darker green purple. Okay, so when we went forward with all of the data and the training and validation sets unfiltered, the algorithm actually performed relatively poorly. Um, the, the error rate was over 40%, so not that far from a coin flip. Uh, and in particular, neoplastic glands were mostly misclassified. More than 92% were misclassified. Um, so this, this initial result may sound discouraging, but uh, we weren't discouraged because as pathologists, we have insight into the histology um, of these glands. And we thought a priori that probably some glands were more likely to be informative than others. In particular, large glands with, that uh, inherently had more architectural information, uh, like the gland in the center of this picture here, 
are likely to be more informative or have more discriminatory potential than smaller glands like the one shown on the upper left of the same image. So we decided going forward that we'd filter out the small glands, which we thought could be adding noise to the data, uh, and only try to classify larger glands. Um, we use number of nuclei as a proxy for uh, gland size. So you can see on the x-axis here are the various nuclear cutoffs that we used. So at a cutoff of 200 nuclei, that means that we're excluding every gland that has fewer than 200 nuclei in it. Uh, you can see that our error rate came down as we increased our cutoff. Um, or in other words, our accuracy improved with increasing uh, cutoffs. We chose a cutoff of 200 for reasons I don't really have time to discuss today. But uh, suffice to say, at this uh, cutoff, our error rate came down to just under 30%, 29%. And our classification error of neoplastic glands was significantly better, uh, with an error rate of about 63%. On the face of it, 63% still doesn't sound great. But the real key here is that our algorithm had a very good positive predictive value of 89%. So that means if our algorithm predicted a gland to be neoplastic, there was about a 90% chance that that gland was actually neoplastic. So we leveraged that in the way that we displayed our data, which I'm going to demonstrate to you uh, now, uh, in what we refer to as data clouds. Uh, so here's one of our cases. Uh, each circle represents a endometrial gland. The small circles are glands that our algorithm predicted to be non-neoplastic. And the large circles, the positive predictions, are, are uh, uh, glands that our, our algorithm predicted to be uh, neoplastic. So I know that most of you are not pathologists, or for those of you who are pathologists, there's no histology here. But I think if you had to identify where the EIN lesion was based on this data cloud, you would point to where these large circles are clustered. Uh, and indeed, that's exactly where the EIN lesion is located in this case. Uh, again, that's the bright green based on biomarker uh, uh, confirmed status. I'll show you a couple more cases just to drive this home. So here's a smaller piece of tissue. Here, I think all of you would point to the left side of this piece of tissue as where the EIN lesion is located. And indeed, that's the case. And then one last example. Um, this is a larger piece of tissue. If you were to draw a boundary around where all of these large circles are, where all the positive predictions are, then you'd be drawing a boundary around exactly where the EIN lesion is in this case. So you could imagine that this tool could be very useful in the hands of a pathologist uh, uh, because it could direct them to the area of the slide that's likely to contain an EIN lesion to make sure that they don't miss that diagnosis um, in sort of a pre-screening uh, uh, scenario. So what we did, uh, there were two sort of important steps in the development of our algorithm. The first was we used our insight as pathologists to exclude data that was less likely to be informative. And the second was to choose a display method that leveraged our robust data points, our positive predictions, uh, to um, display the data in a way so that an end user can integrate the predictions and identify where a lesion is located. Um, so we're very interested in moving this into other organ systems. This problem of localizing and classifying glandular lesions is arguably the most common problem that we see every day in pathology uh, in a variety of systems, including breast, prostate, colon, esophagus, lung, and, and so on. Um, so as a next step, we're very interested in moving into other systems. Um, and then intuitively, the software should improve performance of pathologists. That's what we expect. But we need to do a proof of concept study, and that's one of our uh, immediate next steps as well, um, before we can move to attempting to distribute this software, uh, which is something that we're very interested in. And I'd be very happy to continue conversations about that uh, uh, in the lobby with any of you who are interested. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, uh, in particular, thank George Mutter, who's been a wonderful mentor to me. Uh, and we, we received this grant together and uh, worked on it together. And also my other collaborators, Michael Downing, Peter Huffnagel, and Sebastian Lohmann. And thank you for your attention.